So the second speaker of today is Matilda Delgado, and uh, she will talk about emergence of species scale black hole horizon. Please, uh, Matilda. Thank you. Um, so happy Halloween, everybody. Uh, and thanks to the organizers for having me uh, at the at the String Fino seminars again. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about this uh, recent paper with uh, my supervisor, Angel, and Jose Calderon Infante on uh, emergence of species scale black hole horizons. So I don't think I need to motivate to this crowd that uh, you know general relativity predicts everything that we can measure in the universe. We're close, uh, but of course, at some uh, high ultra high energy, we expect uh, gravity to start behaving in a quantum way and to be replaced by a theory of quantum gravity. So at that point, of course, the structure of space time itself uh, is expected to behave to be subject to all of these quantum things, right? Quantum tunneling, superposition states. So that's when any notion of background space time on which to define your quantum field theories just makes no sense. So of course, at our energies, there is a background space time, right? This is overwhelmingly obvious. Um, so, so what gives? The point is, I think, uh, best translated through uh, what is called the, the emergence proposal or emergence in quantum gravity, which states that um, even though uh, at ultra high energies, there is no such thing at low energies, space time, dynamics, metrics, kinetic terms arise as uh, as a low energy description, they emerge, right? So there's various ways of um, talking about emergence and it's like an ongoing uh, research uh, topic. So there's a lot of debates over how you're supposed to do emergence in the first place, but the, the strong form of the emergence proposal states that at ultra high energies, uh, gravity or physics is topological in nature. That means again, no metrics, no kinetic terms, no dynamics. And that all of these things arise at our energies in the IR because you're integrating out a ton of these UV states. Now, of course, nobody actually knows what this topological theory is. So it's it's more to be taken as an inspiration than uh, than something that we actually control. But so if you're interested in uh, more uh, about uh, the emergence proposal, I, I recommend you read uh, this review by Aaron Palti, uh, who went into more detail than I'm going to go into uh, today. So what do we Swamp Fan people do? We look at um, EFTs uh, at, uh, that have gravity at low energies and devise some criteria for them to be compatible with quantum gravity. What do I mean by compatible with quantum gravity? I mean that as you go up in energy scales, you can uh, actually unite, uh, well, embed your EFC that you started with into one of the known um, low energy limits of quantum gravity theories. So that can happen. You can start with any EFC in the IR. And as you go up in energies, it might happen at some point that you clash with one of these criteria, in which case you'd have to like integrate in new states into your theory to make it compatible and to stay within this, this zone of compatibility. And, uh, you know, and so on, you'd end up with a new theory, a slightly different, well, and slightly is maybe, perhaps not the best word, a different EFT once you've integrated in these states, and you can keep going up in energies, and you might have to do that again. But at some point, you'll reach an energy because where uh, there's no uh, state uh, or, you know, tower of states that you integrate in, that you can integrate in, in order to have a new EFC. There is no way to do that. There is no way to get a new EFC that has semi-classical Einstein gravity as a low energy description. This is the energy at which all of these quantum gravitational effects that I was talking about before become, uh, you know, materialized uh, and that you, you can't talk about these EFTs of quantum gravity anymore or in the way that we usually do. So this uh, is the scale where where um, gravity becomes topological, and we call it uh, the species scale. So today I'm going to be asking, uh, what is uh, the species scale? So of course, naively, you'd be like, Matilda, uh, gravity is not renormalizable. Everybody knows this. And the coupling uh, goes as inverse to Planck mass. So quantum gravity must become relevant when this perturbative description breaks down, so to say, like at, at the Planck mass. But it turns out that in if you if your theory has a large number or any number actually of um, light particle species, then if you compute the loop correction to the graviton to the graviton propagator, you see that the term 
that is suppressing this correction is not just the Planck mass. It's the Planck mass divided by this number of particles to the one over d minus two, d being the dimension. This works in any dimension. Um, so that means that if you have a very large number of light particle species in your theory, then the scale at which these quantum gravitational effects become relevant is way lower than the, the actual Planck scale. So this is great news for anybody who's interested in, in quantum gravity uh, phenomenology. But of course, um, the problem with just taking this at face value is that you don't always have control over the full spectrum of states of your theory. It's not always clear if you can you know, count all of the possible states that you would have running through the loop. So let's look at other uh, possible uh, definitions that have been given in the literature. Uh, the first one uh, is, is the one that's often used and is kind of more of a heuristic argument than something very precise which is that the species scale should be the size of the smallest possible black hole that you can reliably describe within your effective field theory. Reliably, I mean that all the way up to the horizon, you can describe everything with a two derivative action uh, with no extra loop corrections coming into account, uh, like coming into play. Like the, the classical solution is enough. Um, the argument goes that the entropy of the smallest possible black hole that you can describe in a theory with n light species is of order of n. Uh, this was given actually by the first people to discuss these things uh, back in uh, 2006, 2007. Uh, so this is very heuristic. Uh, perhaps more precise definition of the species scale that's been uh, pushed recently by the Harvard group is uh, almost by definition of what the species scale represents, right? It's when uh, you don't have Einstein gravity anymore. And all of the curvature terms, this endless uh, sum of curvature terms become relevant. So that that's when they become relevant, uh, two derivative semi-classical Einstein gravity is just not um, uh, the, the, the correct description anymore. And so the, the energy scale that is suppressing all of these curvature terms should be the species scale almost by, by, by definition. So, you can already see how these two definitions are not uh, completely orthogonal to each other, uh, in the sense that if you take a black hole that is smaller than, this, than the species scale, that means it can't be reliably described in your EFT, which means that at some point, maybe curvatures get large, uh, which means that you need to take curvature corrections into account. So somehow these, these ideas are all part of the same ball game. But what I wanna say today is that the emergent nature of quantum gravity or the emergence proposal makes this connection uh, systematic. Okay. So then you see that um, these two definitions of the species scale are trying to describe in a sense uh, how your EFT might break down, you know, by what it means to be for a black hole to be reliably described in your theory for what it means for higher curvature corrections to become relevant. So, how do EFTs that come from uh, quantum gravity, um, it's going to be string theory, but quantum gravity in general, how do these EFTs break down? Well, um, it, ha it so happens that at infinite distance limits in moduli space of the moduli space of your EFT that you obtain from compactifying string theory, uh, you get these infinite towers of states becoming light, which signal the, the breakdown of your EFT because you can't integrate it in an infinite tower of states. This is the premise of the swamp plant distance conjecture. And uh, you have essentially two options. So if the modulus that you're considering um, is parametrizing the size of a circle inside your compactifying, uh, your compactification manifold, then if this circle is becoming very large, your decompactifying and all of the KK modes from the dimensional reduction that you did are becoming light. So in this, uh, in this case, of course, you see all of these KK modes coming down, you realize that the better description is in terms of a higher dimensional theory, which has, of course, uh, two derivative semi-classical Einstein gravity in, in higher dimensions. So that's what happens in that case. Uh, the other option is to have strong or weak string coupling. So these are limits where um, you have all of these heavy string states that we're ignoring when we take these low energy effective field theories. All of these heavy string states are becoming light. So you have to take them into account and so you have a real, like, full-fledged string theory uh, with all of these effects that we are that are intractable, at least uh, to our current methods. And so <clears throat> this is when you'd expect true quantum gravitational effects to to become relevant. 
So it turns out that these are the only two options as by the emergent string conjecture. So I'm not hiding anything from you. This is everything that happens at infinite distance limits in the moduli space of uh, string compactifications. So the 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 drawing would be, you know, you start with an EFT in low dimensions, you go up, you realize, oh no, there's this tower of KK states coming down. The better description is this higher dimensional theory, and so on and so forth, until you really reach a critical, the 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 species scale, this critical scale, where actual heavy string modes are light, and where you have to have some control over non-perturbative uh, string theory. Okay. So when you have these infinite towers of states becoming light, that means that the number of light species in your theory, of course, is blowing up. A year. So the species scale in Planck units is going to zero. So if you start with your EFT and D dimensions, then you go if you go up in energies, you see that this KK scale might uh, is, is coming down because the you're in a decompactification limit. So then if you integrate in the whole KK tower, of course, we never actually do this. We just realize that it's a KK tower and go to the higher dimensional description. <laughs> then you have your EFT in higher dimensions. And then at even higher <clears throat> energies, you have the species scale, which, um, which is where the quantum gravitational effects come into play. OK. So the point is that the species scale goes to zero, <laughs> but only in d-dimensional Planck mass uh, units. Because if you go into the higher dimensional Planck mass units, <laughs> then uh, the species scale is, is actually, you, you really see the gap between the KK scale and the species scale. <laughs> so, I think one of the most relevant things that's been talked about in the recent year is that the the species scale actually depends on where you're sitting at in the moduli space of string theory. So this drawing that I've been uh, discussing so far is perhaps better described by this drawing here, where you see that in this two-dimensional moduli space, you have a different infinite distance limits. And in some cases, you might have to decompactify before you hit the species scale, and in other cases, you might not. And in particular, in the middle of the Magi space, we actually have little to no idea of what's going on unless and unless you're in a case with a lot of supersymmetry. And there's been a lot of interesting work about this recently. But so we're always talking about these infinite distance limits in Magi space because of that reason. <coughs> okay. So the last thing I want to introduce, <coughs> sorry, is this notion of higher derivative emergence. Emergence, again, tells you that all dynamics in the IR come from integrating out UV states, <coughs> and in particular, towers of UV states. <coughs> so there's this known result in the literature, which is that some higher derivative corrections in lower dimensional EFTs of string theory arise from loop amplitudes in the higher dimensional theory where the external legs are at low energies. <coughs> so. This would look something like this. If you have your amplitude in this EFC, in the higher dimensional one, you can take the external legs to be at low energy. So the modes that you're considering here, the particles, the physical particles, are not are actual particles that belong to the lower dimensional theory. <laughs> so if you do this computation, you see that since you're doing it, the, the, the momenta here are running <clears> through <throat> all the energies that the, the higher dimensional EFT has, that means that all of the states in the tower are somehow contributing to this diagram. And this will lead you in the lower dimensional EFT to higher derivative terms, okay? So usually people talk about emergence for kinetic terms more than any kind of higher derivative terms, but <clears throat> it's a, th what's happening here is in a very similar spirit to, to what uh, people who work on emergence do. Um, and according uh, to definition two of the species scale, which is uh, that the species scale should be the, the scale at which um, that, uh, you know, curvature corrections are suppressed by, then these curvature corrections in the lower dimensional EFT should be suppressed by the species scale. <laughs> okay. So now 
Um, where do small black holes fit into this story? Let me first tell you what a small black hole is, and then I'll tell you. Small black holes are just uh, solutions uh, to Einstein Maxwell scalar, uh, to this Einstein Maxwell scalar action, where the coupling uh, to this uh, gauge field goes to zero as you go to the horizon of the black hole. So F goes to infinity, the coupling goes to zero. <laughs> so in all known st string theoretic examples, this function is actually an exponential of, uh, of the field. And so you see that if F goes to infinity, then the, the field itself goes to infinity. So these <clears throat> small black holes are actually probing infinite distances in much I space. So you're starting to see why I'm interested in them. Um, uh, 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 as a result of this, uh, actually, you can look at the, the metric of these small black holes and you'll see that the horizon, the size of the, of the sphere, the transfer sphere at the horizon, is in fact zero because of the same types of divergences that we see here in F and uh, in the in the field. So these are in fact point-like. They're <laughs> they're not the smallest black hole that you can reliably describe in your theory. They're completely singular from the perspective of the EFT. In particular, uh, they go to infinite distance limit. The curvature blows up. Uh, so so they're not at all uh, what you would define the species scale uh, by. However, for our purposes, they probe infinite distance limits. Near their core, you know, the species scale is lowered because of all these states that are becoming relevant. And curvature corrections are becoming relevant since, again, the curvature is blowing up. So you can see how all of the different ingredients that I need are coming into play at the same uh, time here. So let me just tell you what the point of the talk and the point of the paper is, uh, and then I'll give you an example. So near these small black holes, the species scale comes down and curvature corrections become relevant. Um, if you take into account these curvature corrections and you modify the small black hole solution, you'll see that it actually puffs up and gets a horizon from these curvature corrections. And that this horizon will be exactly of the size of the species scale. Okay, so it's like, oh, uh, I'd like to probe uh, super high energy effects using these uh, super singular small black holes. But no, if I get close enough to it, I realize that I have to take into account these curvature corrections and I'm stopped at the species scale. And the third point, and the most important one, is that the curvature corrections, the specific ones that do this for you, that work, um, are the ones that you get a la emergence from integrating out the tower of states that is becoming light in the limit that the small black hole is taking. So, so in a way, this uh, a la emergence curvature corrections is turning your small black hole into the smallest possible black hole that you can describe in your theory. And these curvature corrections being suppressed by the species scale means that all the two definitions of species scale that we started with all um, join in uh, and unite in this uh, limit, in this example. So we discussed two examples in the paper, one of 4dn equal to uh, compactifications of type 2 uh, string theory. I might not go into some, I, I'm not going to discuss them today because uh, well, they've already been dissected in the literature at, at various times and perhaps the more New and uh, interesting um, example is that of D zero brains in ten dimensional type two A supergravity. <laughs> so, what are D zero brains? They're just D brains that extend uh, only along the time dimension. Uh, they have all of this cool open string physics uh, happening in the UV, but for our purposes, we just need uh, to know that uh, at low energies, they can be described by a supergravity solution to a subset of the type two A effective action, uh, which I've written here where again, you can see there's a scalar, the dilaton, which gives you the string coupling, of course, then the coupling to the gauge fields and uh, the, the the gauge field that the D0 is charged under, right? The Ramon Ramon uh, one form. So for all intents and purposes, this is Einstein Maxwell scalar in 10 dimensions. Um, so <clears throat> the solution is as follows. Uh, this is the just N D0 brain solution um, in the Einstein frame. And you see that at the core at r equals zero, f of r goes to infinity. And so the dilaton goes to infinity. And the size of the transfer eight sphere, where you need to take this r squared into account, uh, goes to zero if you expand the whole thing around uh, r equals zero. So in this way, it's never discussed this way, but the, the, D0, the D, D0 is just the smallest, the, 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 the simplest example of a small black hole in string theory. <clears throat> Uh, and it's the most supersymmetric example, in fact, because you don't need to compactify anything. So 
you see that the dilettante goes to strong coupling at the core of this thing. So the string coupling becomes large and string perturbation theory completely breaks down. Uh, in particular, the low energy limit that you get the, the type 2a supergravity also completely breaks down. So what do we do in that limit? Well, Witten told us uh, <laughs> already a lot of years ago uh, during the second superstring revolution that the better description in this limit is of 11 dimensional M theory. So what you're actually probing <clears throat> is a decompactification limit from 10 dimensional type 2a to 11 dimensional M theory. And there's, you know, KK modes becoming light and the species scale getting lowered. So these <clears throat> KK modes are, are actually known to be uh, heavy D0 states, not, uh, not the low lying ones that we made the small black hole with. And uh, the species scale can be evaluated to be the 11 dimensional Planck mass by, by counting. <clears throat> Here, there's only one tower, and it's a particularly simple one. So you can count the D0 states that are below the species scale and find that it's the 11-dimensional Planck mass. Now, there's been these computations done back in uh, the 90s that showed how you can do loop computations in M theory and take the limits where the external legs are not 11-dimensional gravitons or 11-dimensional fields. They're 10-dimensional, OK? They're, they're taking the lower energy limits for the external legs. And these uh, diagrams generate in the type 2a effective action, uh, these types of eight derivative curvature terms. Uh, so if you had four gravitons, you get the R4. And if you imagine a scattering uh, between gravitons and uh, the ramon ramon uh, one form, with the ramon ramon uh, yeah, one form, you'll, you'll get uh, these types of terms. So the big question then is whether or not these corrections that we get a la emergence generate a horizon for the stack of D0 brains. So we ran a numerical analysis because, of course, these eight dimensional uh, eight derivative things are a bit hard to deal with using the entropy functional formalism um, uh, to see if uh, the, the, the D0 stack actually gets granted a horizon or not. And uh, we found a horizon. So uh, and, and it turns out, like a week before submitting, we realized that also a paper in 2006 had done a very similar thing and also found uh, a horizon. We don't agree with uh, all of the details of what they did, but it's in exactly the same spirit. And uh, the physics agree. I mean, they also find a horizon for a stack of D0 brains, which is, um, you know, uh, surprising to say the least. Um, nobody ever talks about the D0 brains having a horizon at ultra high energies. Okay, so let me sum up the point of the talk, which is that uh, you can take these small black hole solutions and they're super singular. Uh, and if you get close enough to them, you know, the species scale is becoming light. Uh, however, at that point, quantum gravity uh, makes you realize, like the, the emergent property of quantum gravity makes you realize that no, you're in a limit where you can't just ignore this tower of states becoming light anymore, and you'll see it because of this curvature correction, which is becoming relevant. And if you take into account the curvature correction and modify your solution, then you see that the small black hole is not small anymore. It gets promoted to this uh, smallest possible black hole that you can describe in your theory, to the species scale sized black hole. And since these curvature corrections arise uh, at the species scale, uh, the, this unites the two definitions that we, we started with in, in, a, in a precise uh, way. Um, so let me finish with uh, the, the, the moral of the story, or better said, a bit of food for thought. Um, so the point is, even if you try to probe physics beyond the species scale with one of these classical solutions, uh, like small black holes, uh, in an EFT of quantum gravity, it seems that like quantum gravitational effects seep in uh, seep into the IFT, the EFT, and stop you at the species scale. So these, uh, this is through these um, emergent curvature corrections or curvature corrections computed as ally emergence. So, in a way, the EFTs of quantum gravity seem smart enough to hide the true quantum gravitational effects from us because we're always stopped at the species scale and can't go further. So, what does that mean for? probing these effects from the IR, I have no idea. Um, maybe we can't. Maybe there's a smarter way of doing things. Uh, there's papers where uh, curvature corrections generated singularities instead of smoothing them out. So I'm interested in better understanding what kind of uh, physics are at play. This, this is one of them. I'm sure there's there's many. 
um and and how how this relates like what kind of curvature corrections are doing this can they or not be related to some notion of emergence um yeah so yeah uh, that's all thank you for listening and sorry for coughing <laughs> Thank you, Matilda. Very nice talk. And uh, there is uh, uh, already two questions. So the first is from Michael. Please, Michael. <clears throat> yeah, that was a very interesting talk. Though. Thanks a lot. Thank you. The uh, I, had, I had a question about when you talk about the smallest black hole. I wonder if this scenario affects uh, black hole radiation. I mean, black yeah. hole radiation. When you get to the small scale, is do you have a remnant? Or do you have a transition over to a massive string like uh, Witten and Mel Decina talk about with Chad and things like that? But there's different scenarios. How do you handle the uh, evaporation? Um, yeah, so that's a good question. Uh, the you know the evaporation of these species by the black hole. Uh, there's uh, groups working on this, in particular the Munich group. Um, but you can even uh, describe like motivate the fact that the smallest possible black hole. Uh, should be of species scale size, because if you look at um, the amount of time it takes it to uh, to Hawking evaporate and disappear uh, is in uh, is species scale time. You can prove this. So it, uh, in a way, it's, uh, you know, intimately woven with the uh, with the definition of the species scale being the smallest possible black hole. Um, well, that's interesting. So it's almost like a remnant that then goes to infinity then. Because it's it gets stable. Um, the time goes goes to infinity for evaporation. Yeah. Uh, so it, I guess, it evaporates really fast, right? Because um, the species, well, at least in cases where the species scale is high, and you're not necessarily close to the black hole, so the uh, your your species scale is still high enough for you to be living your normal EFT life, then. Then the inverse of that, which would give you some notion of um, time for the decay, is going to be very small, and so I guess it would disappear. It would disappear uh, quickly in that case. I see. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot. Thank you. So, a second question is by Dieter. Please, Dieter. Hello. Many thanks for Hi, your Dieter. super nice talk. Thank you. Uh, I have a following question, namely, if I understand you correctly, you are basically saying that a minimal black hole can only be defined in the presence of higher curvature terms or higher derivative terms. Without, without them, there is no real good uh, notion of a minimal black hole. Do I understand you correctly? Yeah. Um, so this is why these small black holes are interesting, because like usually when you do emergence, you have to find the how the tree level piece competes with the quantum corrections, but in the small black hole case, there's zero, uh, there's no classical contribution to the entropy. So all of the effects come in with emergence. Um, I, For me, what I take from this is that small black holes don't exist in quantum gravity, like they don't really exist because there's always these curvature terms that are going to become relevant. And so really the small, the, the smallest black hole that you can truly get in quantum gravity is the, the minimal black hole, is the, is the one that you get once you include these curvature corrections. Um, okay. That's the way I think about it. Okay, I, I find this a little bit confusing, and I have to think about it because in our papers we also discuss uh, minimal black holes in the pure Einstein uh, or two derivative uh, context. For example, we have a prescription to get uh, BPS minimal black holes in uh, n equals two uh, supergravity coupled to matter, mm -hmm. but uh, still at the level of two derivatives and. Um, these uh, minimal black holes, which we construct, they are following a certain prescription to get the minimal one, have indeed finite horizons. So this would in a be a little, actually a little bit different from what you are saying. So I don't I don't know how to reconcile these two pictures. I think it's just it's just the fact that um, you can perfectly well have uh, the small you can perfectly describe some smallest possible black holes in your uh, tree level uh, two derivative action um, uh, because. These, uh, I mean, there's no, there's no problem with that. The, the issue is with these singular things um, okay. that shouldn't exist, and you see that in fact they don't exist. They are this, uh, this minimal black hole that, uh, that you're. I see. So, you, so you don't exclude, you don't exclude those objects which already exist at the two different exactly. level, level yeah. and, uh, and still one can make them uh, minimal, and still mm -hmm. they uh, give the correct species scale, right? 
Exactly, yes. I have a remark. I mean, in the fastball picture, people basically do the opposite. They try to get rid of horizons. So in their quantum picture, uh, objects which have a horizon at the beginning, at the GR level, lose the horizon due to quantum effects. So it sounds a bit uh, opposite. Yeah. Um, actually, the, those part of the things that I would be interested in better understanding, because uh, it seems here that uh, quantum gravity is is keeping you from seeing all these cool effects. But uh, I guess uh, what you're describing would be a, an example of the, the contrary. So I, I wonder what, uh, what the physics are, uh, what kind of physics are, are doing this uh, in, in, in those cases. I'm not sure. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> hey, Marco, your, your microphone is off. Oh, sorry. I <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I was saying that uh, we have a third question by Carlo. Yes. Hi. Thank you very much for, uh, for your call. I would just like to be sure I understood correctly what you do. So can you get back to the um, to the slide of your talk? I, I don't remember the the number, but the one where you show the three points, yeah, uh, the th three main points of the talk. Uh, this is it? Oh one, no, sorry. The, um, no, no, the one uh, with the list. This one. I understand. Yeah, there was the list. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I see this one. So. Uh, yeah, uh, what I would like to understand, let me use uh, as an example, uh, an example that I know of, the, the example of dilatonic black holes for dimensional dilatonic black holes, for example. Mm -hmm. So in the the solution of the Einstein-Maxwell has a, a sort of uh, singular surface such that the area of the extremal black holes at the horizon goes to zero. Mm -hmm. So uh, if I understood correctly, what you do is basically you, you say that you insert for example, I don't know, a four derivative term, which has some, some scale suppressing it, uh, you you try to see, uh, to, to, to find the, maybe numerically, if, I, if I'm correct, the solution of mm -hmm. this, and you see that this area that was zero in your previous theory now becomes something that is proportional to one over this scale? Yes, exactly. Okay, this is exactly what you find. So that's, it works even for that simple example of, uh, I would say so. If you can embed it properly in a in a string theoretic example, then and make sure that like the curvature corrections are are actually the the the, the ones that I'm talking about, which are the ones that you would get from integrating out like doing this emergence type of computation. I I, I, I that's exactly what I'm saying. Yes. I, I, this is what I'm not sure I understand correctly because don't you put it by hand the 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 higher curvature term that you're saying don't you put them by hand and no, then no, they're... Try, derive the black hole solution from them from the, so the, from the, the curvature corrections are the curvature corrections we consider are in already ingrained in the in the supergravity of it all they're they're known curvature corrections in string theory and the way that they're computed is uh, is through is through these types of um of computations I was talking about. So we're not like making up a curvature term and seeing how that affects the solution. We're really being careful about uh, it's being the curvature term that is going to become relevant in this limit, uh, and of course, it's being already present in the in the curvature corrections to these string theoretic uh, effective actions. Um, so you need the UV origin of these curvature corrections for it to make sense. Um, uh, there's other curvature corrections uh, to type 2a supergravity. Uh, they're not the ones that become relevant exactly in that limit, but you can still consider them. And we evaluated some of them, and they don't give you, uh, well, one of them, <laughs> and they don't give you a uh, horizon. So for me, that's consistent with the fact that you really need this UV origin for these curvature corrections to, for the story to work. Okay, I see. Thank you. Thank you. Uh... Okay, um, we have, uh, let's say the last two questions, by, one by Nicolò and the other by Michael. Nicolò, you can... Yeah, thanks for the talk. Uh, just Hi. when you say that including the curvature correction, you obtain horizon, an horizon, you means that you get a geometry like ADS2 cross S, uh, mm -hmm. cross the eight sphere? <laughs> yes. Analytic. I mean, you get okay. Oh, uh, okay. But... No, we don't uh, derive the whole, the full solution. No, we just do this uh, entropy uh, functional formalism, which uh, basically lets you input uh, the action and minimize the parameters 
uh, on the background of an ADS2 cross SA geometry. And if you find a minimum, that uh, means there's a horizon. So, but we didn't derive the full solution. Uh, we tried to do like a small perturbation of this, uh, of the D0, the known solution, and see if we could solve the equations, but um, we weren't able to. Uh, not, not because it's impossible, just because we're not very familiar with these terms and uh, it was a bit complicated. But I mean, you're saying that it exists if you include this correction. I, yes, I, I would say so. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. No problem. Thank you. And again, Michael. Yeah, I just um, I just wanted to recall one thing was the uh, there's a different way of doing the, um, the the black hole case without gravity because there is a you have a matrix description. For people who studied the D zero brain matrix, unfortunately, you can't solve that either. But they do have done numerical simulations with Monte Carlo, and they've been able to reproduce like the entropy of the of the black hole, for example. You know, from the M theory. I, I believe you mean uh, the R fourth corrections, but that would be interesting to check to see if the yeah, corrections are there. But you it's, mean to it's consider the the CFT dual to to a stack of D zero brains like this uh, super quantum mechanics, right? Exactly. Yeah. And then in this case, you can't really solve it. But you could do a Monte Carlo, and the interesting regime is not weak coupling or strong coupling, but an intermediate regime, which can only be done numerically at this time. But yeah, anyway, uh, that's totally a very good, homework. very good question. Because if if there is truly a horizon, there must be, in some sense, some uh, super conformal fixed points or some some version of that uh, for the super quantum mechanics. But uh, yeah, we're, we're we're actually thinking a bit about this right now. Uh, it's it's a really yeah. good question. Yeah, because sometimes all those R fourths, all those corrections are in there. For example, in the matrix model, the two D case, they, you know, they can check that the brain contributions and the duality and everything is already in the matrix computation somehow. Hmm. So okay. it, it would be a nice, maybe even a check on what you're doing in some that's, situations. That's a really good point. Thanks. Okay, so I think it's a good time to stop to thank uh, uh, Matilda and. Uh, Salvatore, so thanks again for your very nice uh, um, talk. Um, 